Flub the intro there, my goodness, cut to the wrong camera like a noob. Well, I'd love to say a massive welcome and Merry Christmas to all of you. And some of you who may not have seen my post on social media today might be wondering why there's a giant gaping hole here. And that would be where Liam Brennan was supposed to be standing. Sadly, a member of my family contracted COVID on Christmas Eve and they were at our house. My wife's now got it, so far I'm in the clear. But Liam wisely has decided that uh, it's probably best if he steers clear. He's had a few health issues in the past, so obviously he values his immune system probably needs to more than a lot of us do, so that's totally fair enough, but we're, he's, he's sorely missed. But um, today we're going to make the most of it, make lemonades out of a bad situation and just amp up the audience interaction. So if you've got any kinds of questions whatsoever throughout this little wrap up of 2022, make sure you throw them into the live chat. Um, I tried to get the low latency mode going, but it turns out that because I'm a nerd and insisted on streaming in 4K, it turns out that maybe uh, that prevents the low latency thing from happening. So there will still be a little bit of a delay, but hopefully your questions will pop up quickly and I can get onto them as soon as possible. Um, I've chosen probably about 20 items that I think are noteworthy from the year in terms of gear and software and techn technical announcements. Uh, but obviously if you feel like I've missed something that you were stoked on, or you feel like I've included something that maybe wasn't worthy, please make sure that you uh, hit me up and let me know in the chat. Um, so why don't we jump into it? If anybody's interested, we can give you a little rundown of the, I've, I've, I've limited it to three camera angles today, which I feel like is fairly restrained of me. Um, why don't I quickly show you what they are? So we've got, uh, we've got a C500 Mark II in the back there with a the Sigma 35 mil uh, behind the teleprompter. Uh, over here, we've actually got my new Axebo PT4 motion control system. That's rocking a Komodo with a Lauer 12 mil 0D on a Canon speed booster 0.71. X, whatever that means. Um, and this little guy is actually a slider that can go 
uh, that actually has a high torque motor. There's two motors that comes with it. One of them's a high torque motor that actually has enough grunt to run the slider vertically, which is how I've got it rigged right now. If we get some time later on, I can throw the old phone on and um, go over and show you what that looks like. And then we've also got, um, for a specific reason later on, we've got a Canon C70 there with a 70 to 200 and Canon's new eye tracking. Oh gosh, that's an unfortunate shot, isn't it? Uh, but the eye tracking is working now on the C70s, which is a nice little addition. They're trying to catch up with Sony there. And that's running out to a, uh, you can see over here, the preview of that on the DJI transmission. So later on, I can show you how the transmission can actually act as a mimic controller for the RS3, which is a little bit of fun. Um, so yeah, why don't we uh, jump into it 2022? I feel like it wasn't a bad year for tech. You know, there were, it felt like NAB was sort of starting to get back on its legs after the whole pandemic shutdowns and companies were starting to get some of their supply chain issues under uh, under control. Um, so yeah, it was an interesting year. And, and like I said, if there's anything here that you feel like um, I've missed or that you want something else, hit me up in the chat. For instance, we've got James here. I've got to make sure that my, there we go. James Walker, that's gone to the wrong overlay channel. Just bear with me for one second there, James, because you deserve better than that. Let's see here. We're going to say vMix Social wants to go to overlay four. How about that? And hopefully that'll mean that next time we run James's overlay, it goes to the correct one. <laughs> and it doubles up on overlay three as well. Okay, we're going to sort that one out later on. Um, so while we wait for James's comment to clear away, and I apologize for the unprofessionalism of this moment, um, I'm going to show you what's going to happen next once that clears off. Let me get that one out of here. Uh, it's in three and it's in four. Isn't that cheeky? Okay, there we go. We've cleared them off. Sorry, guys, bear with me there. Um, I promise that your comments are going to look way cooler the next time they come up. Um, let's try now from Aloha from Norway. Let's have a look if this one works this time. There it is. That's how it's supposed to look. Uh, thanks, Espen, for the question. Any news on the DJI LiDAR system without the RS3? I'll admit with Christmas and family and all the other things that were going on, didn't have a chance to look into that, but I'm really keen because there's been a lot of use cases that I've had for that. Probably when I'm going to get into that, the next video I've got planned is the poor man's ARRI Trinity setup where I put the RS3 on my Steadicam Zephyr. And I feel like that's going to be a time where I'll get into some of that. So yeah, thanks for following up on it. Keep me honest, because I did say that I was going to look at that. Um, and James just followed up and said, double trouble, all good, man. What a, what a champion. He's willing to um, bear with the technical issues there. So good on you, James. So yeah, feel free to hit, up, hit us up in the chat, participate in this. So it's a bit of a bi-directional experience. Um, let me just see now, now I've flummoxed myself a little bit with that overlay system. So I'm hoping that when I push this button, it should bring that in. We've just got to get James's comment slid away there. Here we are, transparent graphics. So if you want to find out how I'm doing this, I'm happy to nerd out with you on that later on if you need to. So tonight, every manufacturer gets their logo uh, to appear on screen with a custom, vaguely relevant sound effect. And if you want to guess where the sound comes from or even ask me why the hell that sound was relevant, make sure you hit me up in the chat. Um, the delay might come into effect a little bit there, but you know, let's, um, let's uh, see how we go. Hey, get out of Real Steel Productions. Sorry that you're on a plane about to take off. Hopefully you can catch this one up on uh, replay later on. All right, so Canon, that was sound effect from the original Street Fighter from Ryu, who was a Japanese fighter, and Canon's from Japan. Is that a racially insensitive sound effect usage? Happy to be pulled up on that. Hit me up in the chat if that was uh, uncool. But in January, Canon announced a cinevised version of the popular R5 mirrorless stills body. And now that it had improved heating, the selling point of the R5C was being able to shoot 8K 60 frames without the body overheating. So look, I'll admit, I don't know heaps about the R5C being a C70 owner. I felt like my, I was fairly well covered for my needs in the small form factor department, but I've heard really good things about the R5C. And the fact that it just feels like now Canon's stills and video departments are actually talking, which is really nice. Cause back in the early Canon 5D Mark II days, it really felt like that wasn't the case. So yay Canon, thanks very much. Let's see what's coming up next. So the next one we've got is Cook. Let's see, Cook. Nice. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Cook, cookies, you get it. They announced their latest number bump in their ever popular S prime lens range, the S8. 
Everyone loves the cook look, and while you might not love the price tag, you'll love shooting at T1.4 full frame. Good luck to your focus puller. Um, hey, quick one, thanks from Real Steel. Let's just uh, pull that one up there. Make sure we include everybody. Audio and video sound good. Pumped to see this most delectable nerdery later. Bro, you're obviously well on the same page in Nerd Town here, coming to you live from the Nerd Cave, so thanks for that. I'm just gonna uh, whip that one off manually for now so we can see the other graphics. So there's the Cook S8i lenses. You know, the Cooks have the, like I said, the beautiful Cook look. The I stands for eye data, so that's where it's gonna send all of the metadata from where the focus was sitting at any particular point in time through to cameras that support the eye data through the mount. Um, Cooks, beautiful, expensive, lovely, heavy, big, but awesome lenses. Moving right along. Now, this is an interesting one. This is a little bit outside the, f some of you, it might be outside your wheelhouse with filmmaking, but audio behemoth, pl audio plugin behemoth waves shook the dialogue editing world with the release of VX Clarity Pro, a piece of real time noise reduction witchcraft, which I happen to be using right now. So, hey, why, why not just do a little AB comparison and see how that feels for everybody? Let me see if I can just quickly get the phone working here. Uh, we're going to jump into NDI HX camera. We're going to see if my original phone hookup is working. It's got a crop on it from the last stream. Once again, a little bit of unprofessionalism here. But if you bear with me for one second, I'm going to remove that crop and you'll be able to see it full screen. So there's my camera. What I'm going to do here is switch to the phone. And I'm going to, what I've got, I've got VX Clarity Pro. Let me just take that off quickly. I've got it sitting on my Allen and Heath SQ input, which is that one that says audio SQ one and two. I'm just going to jump into the settings cog there. And then I'm going to go up to plugins. It's beautiful that vMix lets you load VST plugins. And then we can see there we've got Clarity VX Pro Stereo. Now I haven't got monitoring on my, in my ears at the moment, so I'm not going to be able to hear the difference, but I'm just going to pop that off. And then I'm going to keep talking and you might hear a bit of that room tone coming through. I'm going to pop that one on again and you can see the AB comparison and we'll take it off again and then we'll put it on again. And then we'll jump into the editor so you can see what that interface looks like. So that is a noise reduction, an AI noise reduction plugin running in real time, which is extremely impressive. If I grab this dial here, I can actually vary I can actually even add more ambience, so I could add more room tone in there. Like I said, I can't hear it right now, so maybe that sounds wild on your end. Hit me up in the chat. Tell me what you reckon. Let's wind it back over to where, roughly where it was there, where it's doing a little AI analysis on the waveforms and clipping off the excess bits of room noise there. As you can tell, I'm not an audio guy, so the way I'm describing it may not be correct. If there are any audio nerds in the channel, please jump in and talk to me about how cool you think this is. I'm assuming some of you have seen it in action in your own work. And I'll just shut that one down now and we'll jump back to the main camera. So that's Clarity VX Pro, uh, which is something that I'm loving. At the moment, it doesn't work on M1 Mac processors. So at the moment, we've got to wait to get Final Cut support. I forgot to give Waves their logo Dude. mention. Dude, uh, let me pop my, there we go. We're back there. So if you, Use other production pipelines, like I think if you're, if you're on something that's not an M1 processor, that's not Apple Silicon, you might be able to actually integrate this into your post-production. But like I said, you saw that one running live, which is insane. In the past, I've used things like noise gates, which are super obvious for removing room. That's basically where once a person stopped talking, it clamps the mic off so the room noise gets cut out. But then as soon as they talk, you sort of hear the swell of the noise, the room tone come back in. This thing's far different to that. It's actually removing it on the fly with some kind of look around magic. So yeah, really cool. Um, thanks, James. Yeah, I think I, I feel like this is a bit of a game changer personally. All right, so moving on. What's next? That was March. We're st now we're going to move into April. So I guess we have our little bit of a downtime before NAB and then everyone goes crazy announcing things and black magic. If I had a girlfriend, she'd kill me. Obviously had their usual 14,000 announcements at NAB, but the one that stood out to me was Blackmagic Cloud, which allegedly, I haven't tried it yet, facilitates collaborative editing between editors anywhere in the world. I've heard some good things. I've seen a few other people say that they've been having some issues with it. So again, hit me in the chat if you feel like there's, um, if you've had experience with it and you've got some comments there. The associated hardware was what looked, looked really interesting to me. On my main edit suite, I run a 72 terabyte primary volume that cost me about 8,000, it's just direct attached story, sorry, direct attached storage. 
So I priced up Blackmagic's Cloud Store 80 terabyte edition and it came to an eye-watering $45,000 Aussie. Now admittedly their unit's fully solid state which probably has a lot to do with the price plus you've got some nice little switches in there for multiple editors to patch into the one uh, volume. So for a small shop with a few simultane simultaneous editors I feel like that's probably going to be a nice option even at that price tag. Um, James asks, let me just jump this one up here. How are you pulling the iPhone live and it appears without delay? So that's NDI. So if you're not familiar with NDI, that's a protocol that NewTek, the makers of TriCaster, released into the wild several years ago. It was very good of them to offer that out for free. Um, it, but it's kind of like Dante for audio in that it takes video and turns it into ones and zeros and throws it out on your network as an asset that any other NDI capable device can pull in. Now you do have to be careful if you've got too much NDI bouncing around your network and maybe some are on Wi-Fi and some are on gigabit somewhere on 10 gig, you know, depending on the, the bandwidth that that computer has access to in terms of whether it's sending or receiving, I'm not doing a good job of explaining this, am I? What I'm trying to say is if you've got heaps of NDI on your network, it doesn't work. You get massive frame drops, you even get completely lost connections. But for if, if you kind of know what you're doing on the network front or if you're just doing one simple connection like I'm doing there with NDI, also the graphics that are coming across the screen are NDI because, drum roll please, NDI supports an alpha channel which is extremely cool. I'm just, it looks like my comments aren't auto leaving the screen. So apologies for that. That's gonna be a little thing I have to do manually today. Um, yeah, so NDI, the phone's going NDI to vMix. The, I've got a program called Pro Presenter here, um, which was actually made for churches by these guy called, guys called Renewed Vision. Um, it's ended up being used by AV providers all over the place. Uh, and this can actually pipe out NDI with an alpha channel. That's how we're getting the graphics transparent, even with the little, you can see the little shadows and reflections. I made those graphics in Keynote, exported them out to ProRes 4444, chopped them up in Final Cut as individual clips, and then threw them into ProPresenter, which sounds super convoluted, because it was. Uh, but I'm a nerd with no life, so that's why I did that. Um, so thanks for the question, James. Moving on, we're in April at the moment, and Still in April, Unreal Engine, which obviously changed the game around COVID uh, and around some of our favorite content being made uh, and the capabilities there. Unreal 5 was announced, which saw some long-awaited tools added for virtual production crews, including things like real-time color correction on set. And they've got this light new lighting system called Lumen that allows for indirect bounce, shadow, reflective source lighting without needing to bake that stuff into the geometry. I've just read that off my teleprompter and couldn't even describe to you really what that does. Uh, so if you're a, a 3D nerd, um, again, hit me in the chat if you know more about that than I do. Um, I've been holding off on my Unreal journey. The PC that I'm actually streaming from today was the one I originally purchased to play with Unreal Engine, but then I got distracted, as I tend to do, with vMix and also a super interesting package called Notch. Um, which has much of the power of UE, but it's designed for VJs, people who tour with concerts, and also for installation artists. So it's got heaps of that real-time GPU accelerated 3D and generative graphics power, but you can have all of these live inputs running into it. So you can have you know touch controllers or audio triggers or MIDI or any of that kind of stuff all running into Notch. I put a pretty big live show together for one of my clients on a 25 meter wide by two meter high LED volume that was all running Notch. Um, also did a bunch of keynote content that was customized for that resolution. I think it was like 7,940 pixels by 1056 or something like that. And we managed to work out ways to feed that screen live from a few different, with a few different techniques. Hoping to be able to show off some of that in some future episodes. I was really, really satisfied with how that um, project turned out. Um, speaking of Unreal Engine, let me just remind you about this other camera I've got going here, which is the Exebo. Uh, now, the Exebo is one of its claims to fame. Let me grab the phone here and give you a little squizzy at it. One of its claims to fame is that it can actually do camera movement linked to Unreal Engine without trackers. Uh, let me just quickly show you what it looks like so you get a bit of a feel. Here we go. Coming around to look at the Exebo. So, like I said, this is a slider. That's the high torque motor at the top of it, which actually has enough grunt to pull this camera rig and, a, and allegedly even larger ones vertically up the slider. So at the moment, I've just got it looping between two keyframes. This is, uh, I've been a motion control nerd for a long time and I've, owned, I've admittedly got onto this one a little later than some, but I'm really excited about it. It's, it the guys who are, the guys who are um, behind it 
are super nerdy engineers and they've got a lot of really cool features. I'll obviously do some way better episodes um, on the Exebo once we kind of get, I get a chance to sink my teeth into it a little bit more. It's got a few things like it's got a built-in camera so that it can actually work like an active track sort of thing. So you can set up tracking markers on something and it can follow it while it's bouncing backwards and forwards on the slider. It can maintain framing. Um, but yeah, they've made a, the list of other features are kind of endless to be honest. So I won't bore you with them now, but the, the Unreal Engine part of it is that they've made their own custom plugin for Unreal that tells the software where the camera is moving on this motion control unit. Now, I'm not sure if they've got focus and zoom included with that, I think they might. I've got focus and zoom motors for this um, system. So you can do pan, tilt, zoom, focus, slide, and allegedly all of that info gets sent to Unreal. And once you've located the Exebo in your 3D scene, you can actually have parallax and camera movement without having to mess with trackers. So that's something I'm super, super keen to, to play with. Um, looks like Luke Harris has entered the chat. And Luke says, we'll hang out one day when COVID isn't such a drag. Can't wait to see what Axebo and UE can do for live stuff. Luke is very good at 3D. He's very good at Unreal Engine. And then there's also my buddy Hans, who has been telling me that while we're on the topic of UE, uh, Unity is actually kind of coming for Unreal Engine. They're trying to cut their grass. They've got some really interesting new power in Unity to do with how you can bring cinema cameras in and tell the software exactly it's, it's in similar ways to how Unreal does it, but it, the way Hans was describing it to me, Unity's thought about things a little bit differently. So yeah, just don't sleep on Unity. They're the other powerhouse in uh, 3D engines and they're, they're really moving into the virtual production space in a big way. How about we move along? Oh, a quick one from Luke while we're on the topic of Exebo. Did you buy the package where Exebo helps you to get the data into UE? So my, I believe that, so this package will do that. And I believe it's just a free plugin that you use um, in Unreal Engine to, um, to tell it what the Exebo is doing. So the Exebo has got a Wi-Fi um, module built into it that can create its own access point or join other Wi-Fi's. And it's also got a hardwired ethernet, which is what I'm using right now. So I've got an app here. Uh, a, a, I pull up a web interface on my laptop and that's how I can control it. You can actually see a live feed. If it, it's HDMI, unfortunately, but if you, you can take a live feed out of the camera and that gets piped through Exebo, you can see it in the web interface and you can also use the live feed for active track in a similar way to what the uh, DJI products do with um, you know, uh, Raven Eye and, and that kind of material. Moving on, I'm kind of blabbing away here, so I need to get it rolling. April, we're still in April, and we're gonna talk about, oh, I forgot to give Epic Games their logo. First Blood. From Unreal Tournament. <laughs> great job. That's Great Joy's logo, because the that company name, which is kind of weird, always reminds me of Coach Z from Homestar Runner. Uh, here I am giving away all of my rationale behind the sound effects, so it's not fun. Um, but 2022, it was really the year that shooting anamorphically became way more accessible. One of the first sets to catch everyone's attention was from little known Great Joy. I'll admit that I don't know a ton about them, but they've got a 1.8 squeeze factor and full frame coverage at a price point that's sort of around the range of some of the other ones I'm about to show you that you're probably a little more familiar with. So I'm keen to check these ones out. Again, if you've had, had a chance to play with these, hit me up in the chat, uh, let me know what you think. Uh, but it really felt like someone figured out how to squeeze anamorphics into a smaller, cheaper package. And then obviously everyone copies that and the market becomes saturated. And it's great for all of us because the prices get pushed down and we've all got an ability to shoot on anam anamorphic lenses much more accessibly, easily, and with smaller rigs, which is super good. All right, let's move along. The Lauer Nanomorphs, Lauer. Her? I couldn't really think of anything for that. They were launched on Indiegogo back in May. Mine arrived about a month ago. Uh, let's have a look here. There they are. Beautiful. Oh, let's see if we can get that on the RS3. Where are we? Oh, oh, oh. You can do it. Come on, C70. You can do it. You can do it. Do you need my face? Do you need my face? There it is. There it is. Oh, there you go. Oh, no. It just likes my face. It's on face priority, so that's why it's struggling. That's why it's struggling. G'day. How you doing? There's the 35 mil nanomorph. Look how small it is. Beautiful. Okay, that's enough of that crap. I'm really impressed with them so far, and I'm surprised by how much I like having native RF lenses, given that my Komodos are RF mount, my uh, 
Canon C70's RF mount, and they're just without all that extra cack on the end to make an EF mount or a uh, or a PL mount work. They're just super compact, super light, and easy to get around with. They only cover Super 35, these ones, so there's, that's a slight ding for them on that front compared to some of the others we're talking about. But for size and speed, I think they're great. As Liam would have said if he was here, blue line goes ping, as they do with my blue front flare anamorphics. Um, let's move along. Where are we now? We're still in May, and May saw a big announcement from Ari. <coughs> Sorry, I'm not quite sure what happened there. Oh. Maybe there's something stuck in the button. Seems to be like a fart noise coming out. Oh yeah, no, there's a little bit of regret and jealousy stuck in the Yari button, so that, that explains that. Um, I guess this camera is for people who like the Alexa Mini LF but want something less good. Um, and while at $65,000 US it might be expensive, at least it won't ship until late 2024. <clears throat> Not to be outdone in the releasing less capable versions of their existing cameras department, RED <laughs> announced the V-Raptor Rhino, a Super 30, pardon me, <clears throat> Super 35 variant of the full frame Raptor that I've got on the shelf just there. And this camera continues RED's unrivaled ability to choose shit names for their products. I mean, is it a dinosaur or is it a rhinoceros? Make up your minds, people. I suppose this camera could be for wildlife or sports shooters that want a bit more magnification at full 8K resolution. And, you know, people like their 35mm glass, so it, I should say Super 35 APS-C type glass, so I can kind of understand it, but it seems a little bit niche. All right, what have we got next? We're talking about June, and now it's time to talk about DJI. Giggity, giggity. They announced the RS3 Pro in June, a subtle improvement on the decently capable RS2. Actually, it was a huge improvement, let's be honest. This thing's just been a game changer for me. The extended arm allows for bigger builds. I've run my V-Raptor, this guy here, with uh, a battery, like a pretty chunky battery attached and allow a 12mm Zero D on the RS3 Pro. So that's a pretty, pretty massive rig to be able to run on something like that uh, that costs you know two thousand bucks or whatever the lidar focus system is insane i know they're really hard to get but they are worth it so if you manage to get a pre-order on one hang on to that pre-order because you're going to love it when you get it i've run the solaire hs 25 mil with a speed booster at t 0.9 on a komodo and as long as it can see a face it holds tack sharp focus all the way from infinity to minimums even moving at speed the transmission, which is the, uh, wi the, new, the new wireless kit, took a while to ship, but it's a lot of bang for buck for the cost of a 500 foot, for, sorry, for, for the cost of a Teradek Bolt 500, as in 500 feet of range, you get roughly three kilometers of range. Some people have even told me five kilometers in some situations, line of sight. Um, plus you get a seven inch high bright monitor. That guy there, let's take the thing off, the graphics off, that one there. You get a seven, you don't just get a receiver, you get a, a really good quality seven inch high bright monitor. And for an extra couple of grand, if you jam, I think it's a thousand bucks, if you jam the Ronin handles on the side, you get zoom and focus controls for um, potentially for a focus puller or something like that. Um, and it's got a gyroscope in it, so it can also act as a mimic controller for the RS3 Pro. So why don't I give you a quick demo of that now? Uh, let's go to the RS3 and I'm gonna head over to this guy. And actually, let me just give you a little bit of phone so you can see what I'm doing. Dun, 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 dun. Let's wake the phone up and let's get my thumb out of the way. All right, so on the monitor here, what you want to do is, it's around here somewhere. It was here before, Why is it, where is it gone? There should be a little, button for gyroscope. This is embarrassing. Gyroscope control, there it is. Turn that guy on. And now you see this little icon here. If I tap that, I've now got control of the camera. So now that now I'm, let me just lock off this dolly so the tripod doesn't move. And if I move, This was gonna be a lot more impressive with a second person in the studio that could sort of follow me or vice versa, but you kind of get the, you get the idea. So look, it's not, I mean, this is an extreme example. I'm at about 135. 
me just jump back to the RS3 so you're not seeing just a shitty iPhone shot. I'm at about, I think I'm about 150 mil. Oh, there you go, 110 mil. You can see on the overlays on the C70 feed there, about 110 mil. And every now and then it loses tilt, which is annoying. You kind of saw that there. There's a recenter button you can hit, which will take the RS3 back to its home. And then you can sort of start again. So yeah, the tilt is probably the main thing I'm finding is a little bit unreliable. But to be honest, this is an extreme example with a really long lens like that. So um, I'm keen to give it a little bit more of a test. When I do that um, episode I was talking about, I'll just turn that off there. When I do that episode I was talking about with the poor man's Ari Trinity. Oi, that's supposed to be off. What are you doing? There you go, there's a nice little bug. So I turn the gyroscope off, but it's still controlling it. Fortunately, I have other ways. So I've got my little tilter remote here, the one that came with the tilter float. And in theory, that should get me back. Dun, 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 dun. Framing, 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 framing. There you go, more than one way to skin a cat. We're back. So there we are. DJI's announcement. Little comment there from James, interested in the transmission system, but the latency was my concern. Look, latency wise, I, I'll admit I haven't done any full on scientific tests with it. I haven't noticed a problem with that. The bigger problem that stands out to me is the noise factor. The transmitter and the receiver both have some hectic fans in them, especially if things are getting a little hot outdoors. So that's something you definitely want to think about. You're probably going to get pinged by your sound recordists in some in close some close up situations. So the Teradex still have it over DJI when it comes to noise. Um, it's not the lightest transmitter in the world, but they've got loads of mounting and loads of powering options. So I think that's all pretty positive. Um, let me just lose that one quickly. All right, let's move along, shall we? I'm just going to save the battery on the phone. And next up, we're in August now, and an announcement from Saru. There are dozens of us. Dozens! Sorry, that's harsh. I'm sure lots of people like Saru. Um, they announced a new entrant into the increasingly crowded, small, light, cheap, anamorphic market. This one beats out the nanomorphs on squeeze factor slightly. The nanomorphs are 1.5, these are 1.6. And squeeze factor matters. Like in the in the side-by-side -side tests I did the other day, you might have seen against the Orions. I feel like the two by squeeze factor is a noticeable improvement over something like a 1.5 squeeze. But again, you're kind of getting what you're paying for. They're, they're a way cheaper lens. These uh, Saruis also have full frame coverage, uh, but the nanomorphs still win on speed slightly and price slightly. Sarui would go on to add a 35 mil and 135 mil to that lineup. So starting to be starting to get to be a pretty interesting little collection there. And the full frame coverage is definitely cool. Back to giggity, DJI. Giggity. I've often looked at FPV drone content and thought, that looks like fun. And then I've remembered that I've got undiagnosed ADHD and get easily distracted, so should never be trusted with a flying whippersnipper that's meant to get too close to things. But once I saw this bad boy announced, I felt like they'd finally made it easy enough and safe enough for even dickheads like me to give it a go. Unfortunately, they're almost impossible to get a hold of. If you've managed to use or even buy one, let us know in the chat. Um, I, I've kind of looked a little bit into the control system. I mean, you've got your standard FPV controls, which are a much more reliable way of controlling them, but they've got this, this um, I don't know what you would call it, basically like a gyroscope stick. So you just hold it and by moving it around, you actually control the drone. You've got a little thumb button as well. Um, so, you know, they're, they're definitely open, opening this thing up to easier use. And, you know, I use the hell out of my Mavic 3 Cine, um, but being able to get a little closer to things would be cool, maybe, you know, not sure how Casa would feel about that, but um, you know, there's plenty of other people doing it. Moving on. Still in August now, we saw the beginnings of artificial intelligence entering the creative industries for the first time in a major way with the launch of DAL E. Some of you might have heard of that. This year, a new entrant, Stability AI. I'm a very stable genius release their text-to-image generator, Stable Diffusion. I'll admit that I'm a bit late to the party on some of these tools, but I've had a play with their beta tool, Dream Studio, and it's a lot of fun. Let's, why don't we just fire it up and see if we can make something depressing. Um, let me have a look here. If I jump over to, so Dream Studio is one of their beta tools that they've got going. Um, let me just launch that one up here and I'll show you. So I'm gonna take that off and I'm gonna put this on. There you go. So, like I said, it's text to image. So let's put in, um, 
a post-apocalyptic cityscape due to the effects of climate change. You can see how quickly this runs. So that you've got all of these settings here where you can obviously vary how many images it's creating and uh, there's, a, there's a hell of a lot of configuration options there. I'm using their 1.5 model at the moment. I could actually crank that up to two and see what, see what um, that does for us. So there's an example of a post-apocalyptic world. Um, what I've kind of, kind of heard from people that have been using this is it is more suited to these kind of um, landscapes and futuristic game scene creation, uh, storyboarding kind of stuff, whereas some of the others are better at faces and people. Um, I haven't had enough of a chance to play with it to sort of say either way on that. Um, why don't I just crank this up to Stable Division ver version 2.1 and see what happens. So we'll hit dream again, and then see what it comes up with. Any minute now. Dee, do, dee, do, dee, do, dee. Yeah, that's kind of cool. Much more futuristic, go away please. Much more futuristic look to that one. So there you go, that's Stable Diffusion, really interesting. Um, let's take that off now and we'll chuck this guy back on. And moving on. So yeah, AI is starting to come in to what we do more and more. I think we all need to be conscious of it and think about how to use it to the best of our abilities and preempt what it might mean for the future. Uh, in September, Adobe... Loser revealed that they were purchasing the hugely popular collaborative design tool Figma for $20 billion. Because when you've created a captive market of fuming creatives paying $70 per month, you can put aside pesky responsibilities like innovation, reliability, or product support, and instead take some of those ill-gotten gains to the market and pay a veritable shite load of cash to shut down a potential future competitor. There's my Adobe rant that I try to squeeze into as many episodes as possible. Moving on, September, Sony, we're still in September, Sony. Sony Germ. Bonus points to whoever can guess what movies that, that, that's from, it's a classic. Sony felt like they too could take one of their popular products and release a less good version by taking the FX3 and making the sensor smaller. Okay, okay, I get it. Some people really like their old APS-C and Super 35 lenses, so I'm sure this can be a good thing. Sony have gone gangbusters with things like the FX6, um, I am a massive fan of the, of the feature set that you get, especially for the money. I still hate their color signs. I still just don't like the footage, to be honest. It might just be that I haven't found a recipe for it. If you have, let me know. Uh, moving on. Still in September, Atlas hopped on the affordable anamorphic bandwagon, but they kind of forgot about the affordable bit. I love my Orions. 40 mil. Love those guys. Uh, and the two, they're a two by squeeze factor, obviously, which is very attractive. Um, I feel like these Mercuries are gonna be a tough sell for Atlas. They're only slightly cheaper than the flagship Orions. And while they're smaller and lighter than the Orions, they're still way bigger and far more expensive than the other affordable anamorphic lenses we've already covered. So it'll be interesting to see how they receive once more of these units get out into the wild. Still in September, actually, I got the, the month wrong here. This should say December. Wait, wait a second, what's happened here? Wait a second. Freefly, makers of the Movi, the DJI then ripped off to, to great financial benefit to themselves. Also makers of the Alta drones, which are pretty amazing, heavy lift drones. Freefly just dropped in, it's not September, it's December, I apologize, with the Ember. Now they came out with a camera called the Wave, I think it was earlier this year, it might've been the year before, that was a little bit of a fizzer, like it just didn't quite hit in terms of feature set. Um, I think it could get up to 400 frames a second. The Ember can do 600 frames a second at 5K, 800 frames a second at 4K. Uh, it's a Super 35 sensor. My Raptor, I can get up to 600 frames a second, but I've got to crop it down to 2K to get there. Whereas this can get it at full, full field of view 
uh, Super 35. I'm not actually sure whether when you go down to 4K, it's a crop or a pixel bin. My guess would be it's a crop. So maybe that's not full field of view to get 800 frames a second. Probably the biggest downside of this that I've seen so far is the native ISO is only 300. And when you're shooting slow-mo, obviously light is a massive issue, trying to get enough light into these things with the shutter speeds that you need to shoot at to get 800 frames. So only being able to shoot 300 ISO is definitely a drawback. I mean, the form factor of it, it's definitely made to go on drones. And so you're probably gonna be shooting outside in sunlight most of the time, which really helps in that, in that regard. So it could be a really interesting camera. For that price point, I'd definitely be buying something else. There's a lot of other, I mean, you're getting pretty close to a Raptor kit at that point. I think it's about 40K for a Raptor kit roughly. So you're not far off. And the Raptor can obviously do a lot more than a, a, a slow-mo um, purpose-built machine could like the Ember. But yeah, it was an in interesting one there from Fle Freefly. There's someone on the way. Uh, I forgot to put the second part of that sound effect in, but I was trying to be subtle, I suppose. All right, we're moving on. December. This one kind of threw everybody for a loop in a, in a cool way and also kind of a scary way from OpenAI. Skynet fights back. I mean, this feels like the future more than, you know, when, when dickhead Musk announced the Cybertruck, I felt like I was getting the future for a moment there. I even put in a pre-order. I'll be canceling that now that everyone's found out that he's a dick bag. Uh, but this chat GPT thing from OpenAI really feels like there's a scary but also cool frontier that we've just crossed just, just in this last month. So if you don't know what chat GPT is, it's, an, it's a language model that they've trained on basically the whole internet, but I think Twitter gave them access to all of Twitter. Uh, they've, they've let it read almost every computer program that's ever been written so it can code in almost any coding language. Uh, books, movies, TV, all of those things it's, it's been given access to. They've limited it to um, information up to 2021, so it's, it can't, you can't search it for any kind of current information, and it can't trawl the open web. So uh, that's an interesting little handbrake they've put on what could be potentially a scary but also cool feature. I mean, I've heard people say that this is going to replace Google, that we'll think through a tool like this. Um, it's pretty wild. Like, let me give you a quick example of what I'm talking about. Um, if I jump into the beta that I've got access to here, um, just give me one second. All right, let's start a new chat. Let me give you a little look at this. So this is chat GPT. So it works like a chat, like you would if you were, you know, talking to a chat bot on a equipment help site or something like that. Um, and you can, you can you start threads, so you can sort of ask it to do something. And then as it gives you responses, you can ask, you can refine it and kind of change it as it goes. So let's see what we've got here. Uh, we'll try write a script for a YouTube episode that recaps the filmmaking equipment that was released in 2021. As I said, the, they've only given it access to info up to 2021, so that's what we'll go for. And I'll say also, include some banter at the start about the fact that one of the hosts, in brackets, Liam, had to pull out due to COVID-19. All right, ready? Let's see what happens and I'll read it to you. Hey everyone, welcome to this week's episode of Film Buffs Unite. I'm your host, Sarah. Unfortunately, my co-host Liam had to pull out at the last minute due to a COVID-19 exposure, but never fear. I'm here to bring you all the latest and greatest filmmaking equipment that was released in 2021. First up, we have the highly anticipated Canon EOS R5. This camera's made waves in the industry with 8K, blah, blah, blah. Next up, we have the DJ Mini 2, a compact and lightweight drone. On the audio front, Sennheiser USWD portable wireless system has been getting rave reviews. And last but not least, the Aperture LS C300D LED light is a versatile and powerful light source for both photography and videography. Blah, blah, blah. So those are just a few of the standout pieces of equipment that have been released in 2021. As always, we'll keep you updated on the latest and greatest in the world of film. Thanks for tuning in and stay safe out there. Look, apart from the fact that it called me Sarah, that's pretty bloody impressive. Like I said, it doesn't, uh, it can't access current information at the moment. So that's why we're talking about 2021 gear there. But it literally writes that in front of you. Like it's in real time. It's crazy, crazy scary. All right, let's get rid of that. And then let's... James, 
Quick comment from James, taker of office work jobs. It's been super cool to see in these last months or two, all the new AI programs that have come out and where it will go to next. Yeah, I'm about to talk about one other one that is crazy cool. Oh, Matty Nice has entered the chat. It is friggin' insane, dude. I miss you, bro. It's been too long. Now I've got to clear that off manually. Go away, Matt. No, I'm just joking. Chat GPT. Nuts. All right, let me just jump across to here. And let's talk about the same guys, OpenAI, which was this Skynet one. Skynet fights back. Just a couple of days ago announced a text and image to 3D model AI, AI um, system. So you can write into this, uh, I haven't got the demo in front of me here, but you can basically type in, give me a model of a watch. And it's gonna build you a 3D model. Admittedly, at the moment, what it does is create what's called a point cloud. So you can see down there and those little GIFs at the bottom, which is supposed to be looping. Uh, they, it's like little collections of dots that form the shape, but then they have an extra part of the system that will actually convert that to a mesh. It's not quite as accurate as you'd want it to be yet. But I mean, this stuff's moving so fast and the fact that it can, it can build a complex 3D mesh just based on a text input is insane. So yeah, I mean, life is going to be really really interesting you can make you can have your content written for you you can have the imagery made for you another interesting one that i'll give you a quick mention of as well that i was going to do a demo of if liam had been here because i kind of needed someone to model for me to do it uh, is a program called runway runway.ml is the website um, and that's an ai video and photo editing tool that sh is really really interesting so you can do things like i, I just for a client the other day I they had a shot of a truck that needed a logo removed. There was, you know, a shaky camera going. There was movement in the shot, the whole deal. All I did was throw up, upload a ProRes clip into Runway, just pick the first frame where I could see the logo. On one frame, I just brushed a little, this sort of little colored brush that they provide you over the logo. And then I hit go and it went and removed, perfectly removed that logo as if it had been airbrushed with the background perfectly replaced on every frame of that video. I could export it for free. I could export it out to 720. You can pay like 12 bucks a month or something to get, I think 1080 and maybe 4K and ProRes. So I could only do a H.264 720 out of it. Um, but some of the other tools it's got are nuts. It's got this frame interpolation one where if you take a series of uh, high speed photos, like if you film, I was gonna do that with Liam and go click, 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 kind of film, get him to move slowly. It will then build all of the intermediary frames to create like a perfect slow motion shot. It'll just create them using some kind of optical flow, analyzing what the missing frames would have been between those photos. You can do all of the same kind of what we were doing before with stable diffusion that's built into runway. So you can actually train, uh, train it on a face. So you could do it on yourself. For instance, you could feed it in a whole bunch of different photos of yourself um, and then get it to create new photos of you in all a whole range of styles so in terms of the locations you might be in the poses you might be doing the style of photography or maybe it's more of a style of painting or art or something like that it can create all of those for you um it's yeah it it, it it's wild things are getting really really crazy and you know it's easy to kind of look at it and say oh they're doing us all out of a job but at the end of the day it's all about story who tells the best story who who combines all of these tools together to make something worthwhile i think is still is that, that that's still how you win. Um, and yeah, you can't, I guess you just can't bury your head in the sand. You've got to f keep abreast of what's happening and use it to the best of your ability. So yeah, it's been an interesting year. I don't know about next year. I'm trying to think how I feel about it. I feel, I feel hopeful and excited and I've got some projects I'm really keen to sink my teeth into that are more me projects instead of just responding to the needs of my um, last minute clients. Uh, so it should be an interesting time. Um, like I said, I had that one big one this year that I was um, really keen to show people, which was um, using Notch. And there's a lot that's got way more potential than what I've even gotten into so far. Like there's some of the things you can do with, like I've got a, um, a an in industrial version of the old Xbox Connect cameras that Microsoft makes, uh, which you can actually plug into Notch. So I'd be able to have that sort of sitting next to my actual camera and the connects building a 3D mesh of me in real time and feeding that into Notch, telling it what my geometry is in real time. And then I can have graphics bouncing off me or interacting with me, or I can move my hands and actually throw a piece of graphic off the screen or bring it on or anything like that. Um, yeah, it's it, there's a lot of really cool potential out there. So um, yeah, listen, if anybody else 
wants to drop in on the comments, feel free. Um, sorry again that Liam couldn't be here. It would have been cool for you not to have to just listen to my voice for a whole stream. Um, I'd love to be able to talk to a human, but uh, COVID just gets in the way at the most Im inopportune times. But to everyone who's watching live and everyone who might rewatch this, uh, just want to wish you a massively happy holiday season. Hope your 2022 was satisfying. And I hope next year turns out to be something great for everybody. And uh, I won't start talking about politics because that's kind of my main passion and it'll get, it'll get weird. But um, yeah, one of my little projects next year is to get my political satire channel back up and running again. Come on, Dan, just do it. Stop talking about it, bro. All right. So why don't we say goodbye to the C500 Mark II. We can say goodbye to the Exebo, which is still running on two NPF bats, two fairly small Sony NPF bats. That sucker's been dragging itself up and down the slider vertically the whole time with not a tiny camera build. I mean, it's a Komodo, but it's got a chunky battery on the back, you know, cinema lens. So that's pretty cool. We can say goodbye to the RS3. Hey, how you doing? Oh yeah, and there's that, there's that eye tracking, see that? G'day, how you doing? Oh, no one needs to see that, that close up, far out. And that's enough of that. So everybody, love you heaps. And uh, thanks for watching the small bits and pieces I've been doing. I know it's been slack for the most of the year, but I'm ready to get, get into it in earnest and do some cool stuff. Like I said, the next one's probably gonna be the poor man's Ari Trinity, where we get the RS3 on top of the Steadicam and execute some of those million dollar shots where you can start down at somebody's feet and then perfectly just come up to their face while you're orbiting around in a very stable, steady, beautiful environment with LiDAR autofocus. So you can do all this stuff like I like to as a massive Nigel on my own with no crew, because that's just kind of how I roll. All right, that's it. Now, what I failed to do in the rush to get all of this elaborate stuff set up was come up with like a closing thing. So what's probably gonna happen is that it's just gonna,